So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kesley. Hi, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share this presentation with you guys. Can everybody see that? So we're here today to talk about sharks in the Gulf of Mexico and real time tracking of these apex predators. And so let's see. So first things first is we always ask, are sharks really this scary? And usually in a live presentation, we get lots of hands. Yes, yes, they are. But we would like to suggest that not really. Sharks are uh, natural to our oceans and that it's actually us humans that are that scary. We pull out more sharks than sharks actually accidentally bite. Um, in a given year, we pull out hundreds of millions of more sharks every year than um, they can withstand. And so this is kind of a, a problem globally. The big issue is that a lot of sharks are um, pulled out of the ocean, we need them there, but they can't sustain this level of fishing. So this top picture is actually a picture provided by Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, it's one gill net that was pulled. Um, it's an illegal gill net and there was over 2000 sharks in that gill net. That's not something that's sustainable for this species um, and, and something that happens all too frequently here, um, even off the coast of Texas. This bottom picture, um, it's on my left, um, is a picture of shark fins that are on top of a roof in Hong Kong. Um, a lot of times sharks are pulled out of the, the ocean just for their fins. And so the, the carcass is dropped overboard uh, minus all of the fins. And so unfortunately, this is something that um, people don't think about, but that shark drowns. Sharks obviously can't swim without their fins and that shark is alive when it's dropped overboard. Um, and so uh, this has actually happened to one of our sharks. My second day in Texas ever, uh, I got the privilege of help tagging this scalloped hammerhead here. And a couple years later, um, while we were actively tracking him, he was pulled and uh, illegally out of US waters and harvested down in Mexico. But with all of that, why should you even care about sharks? Hollywood portrays them as scary and man eaters, but that's not the case. Sharks are apex predators, so they are at the top of their food chain, but they ex uh, present something called top down control. So they help keep the rest of the food web in check. This is very important if you like to eat seafood. If you like tuna, um, snapper, crab, any of that, you want sharks in your ocean. Sharks not only just, they not only eat um, the weak or the sick fish, but they also keep other shark populations in check. They keep tuna populations in check. And so each species further down the food web is not being overrun by its uh, immediate predator. And so all that happens, not just here in the Gulf of Mexico, but globally, but what do we actually know about sharks, especially here in the Northwest Gulf of Mexico? Shark science is actually still in its infancy. We don't know things like where they go after they're released. Um, in some parts of the world, we don't even know how many are caught each year. And so um, actually what we do know in the Gulf of Mexico is most of what we can reconstruct from the past. So we have long-term fishing tournaments like the deep sea rodeo in Alabama, the one out of Port Aransas. Um, there's been a couple of shark fishermen that have kept really good records, um, some commercial data, but that's it. That's pretty much what we've known, uh, and especially until recently, when we've started really looking into these populations here. And so a lot of that came from newspapers, as you can see with quite a few of these pictures. But the problem with this data is you get something like a leaderboard or a an article that only announces this big fish that was caught. So we can tell you what the biggest of the big were caught, but we can't tell you how many, and we can't tell you, you know, when you bring in a shark to a tournament or a fish to a tournament, you bring in the biggest. You're not gonna win with the smallest. So we, we lose all that um, detailed data further down the size. And so with that, at the Heart Research Institute, we attempted to start, we have started a shark research initiative where we work with local anglers to tag as many sharks as possible. 
So the shark fishery here has actually turned away from an harvest fishery to a catch photo release fishery, um, especially for the local tournaments that happen um, on like pins and, and down some of the beaches in Texas. And so these guys actually deploy a lot of these dart tags for us. Um, and so they take photos, they take measurements, they take biological samples, and they submit that data to us. In addition to that, we have a acoustic and satellite telemetry tagging initiative where we tag as, uh, tag as many apex predators as possible um, to see where they go. And we do this with a variety of tags. Um, again, this dart tag down here is the tag that we use for uh, the rodeos and for local fishermen. And so the people that help us are called citizen scientists. Um, this is especially important because we partner with, like I said, rodeos, the Texas Shark Rodeo and Sharkathon. And to date, they've tagged over 6,200 sharks off the coast of Texas, which is incredible. Um, this initiative started in 2008, and you can see in this picture, these guys line up down the beach for Sharkathon. They kayak cow baits, they fish from the top of their trucks, um, and they, they have this massive initiative and push to get these sharks tagged every year. It's 380 something anglers fishing this tournament versus the 15 that are in you know, our office. They can tag a lot more sharks than we can in a year. And so we're proud to partner with them. Um, so this is how they fish from the beach, which is a little different than how we fish offshore. Um, they fish from these things called shark racks, which are attached to the top of their trucks. And then they take the measurements um, and then they also, we have a couple of anglers that have helped us to tag some satellite tags and some acoustic tags, but then we get to collect that data and we're happy to share with them all the, all the things we learned from their tagging initiative. But then there's another type of tag that we like to put out. Um, this one's called an acoustic tag. So different types of tags give us different types of data. And this tag must have a receiver for us to get data. So there's a unique ID number for that tag, and that tag is usually pretty good um, if we're trying to figure out where sharks go. So for the dart tag, the ones that our anglers like to put out, you only get the initial tag and the recapture data. We don't know what happened between those two um, incidents. Um, there's no active tracking, and we rely on whoever recaptured the shark to call in the number and tell us it was recaptured. Whereas this, track, this tag can passively track. So as each time a shark passes a receiver, we can tell where that shark's been. Um, this is called acoustic telemetry, and we do this for a variety of species, including sandbar sharks and uh, short fin makos. Uh, acoustic telemetry can be put on any species, whereas so can the dart tag, whereas some of our satellites cannot. And so we have a big, um, initiative to monitor sandbar migrations here off the coast of Texas. And this is a unique one. So to date we have um, just around 20 sandbars tagged. And this is one that was tagged on the Osearch cruise in 2015. And she actually left the Gulf of Mexico and went up to the coast of Virginia where we got a call from the Navy, which you never want to get a call from, saying that they had detected one of our sharks on one of their submarine receivers. And then we had some colleagues in Florida that notified us that they also had heard from one of our tags. And so she had left the Gulf of Mexico and come back passing through Florida. So what's unique about this migration is that sandbars are known to pup around Chesapeake Bay. Um, they, there are also nursery grounds here off the coast of Texas. So why she feels the need to migrate to Chesapeake Bay to pup is something that we're not sure of today. It's thought that um, females may pup in nurseries where they were born. And so she may be one that was pupped in Chesapeake Bay and then somehow migrated to Texas. So uh, hopefully we can tag a few more females and start to answer some of those questions. But then our third type of tag is the spot tag or the satellite tag. And so this tag cannot be put on every species. Um, it's not great for sandbars. Uh, this tag requires that you cut the shark come to the surface where these wet dry sensors here um, can register as dry and that's when it sends its message to the satellite where we get a location. A sandbar who doesn't come to the surface that often 
is not going to send that many data points to us. And so we still are in the dark about where they go, which is why that we use the acoustic tags for them. Again, a reminder, the acoustic tags require a uh, receiver for us to get data, whereas we can track a uh, shark that's tagged with a satellite tag anywhere in the world. And so we tend to put these on species that will come to the surface, like short fin makos. So for us, like I mentioned with the citizen scientists, they kind of fish from the shore. We tend to fish from a vessel offshore looking for more pelagic species. And so we hand line them in rather than use rod and reel like the recreational anglers do. And then we attach the satellite tags to the dorsal fin of the shark and then she's released. And so you can track our sharks just like we can on the OSEARCH tracker. You can go to osearch.org or meetoursharks.org um, to track our sharks and you can see where they go. We have some interesting uh, individuals that we've tracked in the past, um, not just short fin makos, but we have some tiger sharks and some scalloped hammerheads um, that have all been uh, previously tagged and tracked and those tracks are still on the website. But I personally study short fin mako sharks, and this is the shark that's known to be one of those acrobatic ones. Recreational fishermen love to catch them because you can get them leaping up out of the air. Every once in a while, they get pretty close to the boat when they leap, um, which is always fun to see and um, entertaining. The problem is short fin makos are actually a declining population. So in the North Atlantic, um, there's a 52% chance of recovery if no short fin makos are caught between now and the year 2070. There is not a ban on this species, so the species is still fished for pretty regularly. However, the species is also caught pretty frequently as a bycatch in a lot of the longline fisheries, um, so it's still being landed. The meat is highly prized, as are the fins in, um, in overseas fisheries. So the first shark that I ever tagged as part of my dissertation was Harvey, named after Harvey Wild, the conservationist. Um, and Harvey was unique. So he's a mature male that was just shy of eight feet, tagged here off Corpus Christi. And for two years, he was a winter Texan. So he hung around in the winter, but he would summer down in the Caribbean Sea. And he made his same trip back every year at the same time, almost to the day. So. Being the student that I was, I thought I had migrations figured out for short fin mako sharks. The males like to go to the Caribbean Sea. Well, so we continued to tag because the sample size of one is not a great sample size. It's not something you can infer to the population. And so we tagged Pico, who's also an adult male, around eight foot. And he decided not to go to the Caribbean, but to go up to New England. Completely opposite direction. He again winters off the coast of Texas, but summers off of New York um, and New England. And so that's very different than what Harvey does and something that again through a kind of a wrench in what we were assuming about uh, male mako sharks. So our next shark that we tagged was Peggy Hughes. She's kind of a large female. She was just shy of 13 foot. Um, she was actually tagged during the filming of our 2017 episode, The Lost Cage, for Shark Week. And she did something completely different than the males. She actually remained in the Gulf of Mexico um, and stayed along the continental shelf. And so she didn't, she didn't go anywhere like the boys did. And then we got this unique experience where we got to tag one of, we've had only adults till now. And we got this unique experience where we got to tag um, a smaller male. So he's an immature male. And so in this video, you can see we actually have a cradle. We work a lot with a head, couple head boats out of um, Port Aransas here. And so being as tall as those boats are, you can't bring the sharks on board. We like to keep them in a cradle where we can keep water flowing over their gills. But this little guy was caught um, in 2018 and or in 2019, and his name is Chancellor Shark. He's actually named after Chancellor Sharp of the A&M system. And he did something very different than our mature males. He spent his entire time in the Western Gulf of Mexico like Peggy did. Um, he didn't leave uh, and to this date, he's still here as far as our tracks have, have determined. And then this year, 
uh, we got the chance to tag another small shark, a female this time, and her name's Evelyn. And Evelyn is doing the same thing Chancellor Shark is. She's hanging out in the Western Gulf. Um, she has not left either, and we're still actively tracking her. Both of these are considered immature, um, which is a different size class than a lot of the adults that we've been monitoring. But something that's kind of interesting about our sharks are we have these big females that we've been catching that in previous studies um, is kind of a size class that's missed. We don't see them. And so we've had two to date, one um, tagged from a vessel offshore and one from the beach, but they have something in common. They have these bite marks. Um, so sharks are known when they're mating to be very violent, the male tends to bite the female, which leaves marks um, exactly like these. And so it's thought that we could potentially have a mating ground here in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Texas. This is especially important because we're not really sure where short fin makos go to mate, much less where females go to pup. So potentially, if you remember Peggy Hughes' track, she could have been pregnant at the time that we tagged her and um, short fin makos just ate or are pregnant for 15 to 18 months. And so she could have given birth a year and a half after we tagged her, especially considering her bite mark was very fresh. And so um, that jaunt, if you remember on her, her track where she stayed along the shelf for the most part, and then she kind of moved off um, toward the end of her track is a, is potentially where she could have given birth. So it's hypothesized the shortfin makos tend to stay on the, the females tend to stay on the continental shelf until they're ready to give birth and they move into deeper water to give birth. This is all based on um, the dart tag data um, from like the 1970s and 80s and some long line data where you, where the researchers noticed that there were smaller sharks in deeper waters. They looked to be neonate or just born and there were some larger um, pregnant females that they were catching that looked to be almost full term um, in their long lines. So this is our episode from 2017 and kind of the basis of a lot of the research that I did um, at A&M Corpus as a doctoral student. So in this episode, we kind of looked at how sharks use um, artificial reefs or fish aggregating devices. And so that's something else that we don't know, especially here in the Gulf of Mexico. Sharks are often targeted around these, um, these structures. But we don't know how long they remain around them, when they're using them, what they're using them for. It's thought for food, um, but if you have like a, we know fish are attracted to them. So if you have this huge fish population around this um, structure, why would the shark ever leave? And so a lot of our tracking is um, kind of revolves around this premise of trying to figure out how these sharks are also using these artificial reefs. So sharks, like I mentioned before, are balance keepers in our ocean. They are apex predators and something that our oceans need to be healthy. A sh ocean without sharks is a scary ocean. It is also an ocean where there are no fishermen because fish populations are skewed. Um, of sharks help make healthy oceans. And that's something that we can't stress enough um, when we give presentations like this and as we do our research. All our research comes back to sharks are key to keeping our oceans healthy. And so with that, there's a lot of people that help make this possible through funding and a lot of field work. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, so if anybody has any questions um, regarding the presentation, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can drop some questions in there and we will try to get those answered for you. I 
I do have one question for you, Kesley, about um, Mako's anatomy. So I noticed in some of those photos, they kind of have like a real wide towards the, their caudal region. What is, what is that for? Like their tail region gets real wide before it gets to their tail. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons that they can swim and do the acrobatics that they can do. That caudal region is very streamlined, but it's very powerful and full of muscle. And so it kind of expands out. Um, that's how they can be the fastest uh, shark in the ocean. And that gives them that power to push up and flip up out of the air. Um, so sharks, mega sharks, especially in the Atlantic and in the Pacific tend to chase seals and, and whales and things like that. Not so much here in the Gulf, just because we don't have those species. But um, that big caudal tail allows them to chase seals who are very streamlined and can swim very fast. And so that's just something evolution's kind of helped, helped make them successful for their, their prey. All right, we have a couple of questions. If we log on to the site for tracking, will it give us info um, for the shark itself? Yes. So if you go to the website, you can click any shark and it'll give you like a biography on the shark. So when it was tagged, who tagged it, why it's named, what it's named. And then it'll give you specs on like the length, what it weighed, um, and then how long it's been tracked. How many sharks are typically found close to shore versus offshore in the Gulf? So that's a good question. Um, we don't have an exact number. We do know that there are hundreds of species of sharks and they do inhabit different regions in the, in the ocean. And so there are species that are close to shore like black tips and bull sharks. And then there are species that are more pelagic like the short fin mako. That being said, we do have some shore fin makos that were tagged pretty close to shore. Um, in fact, they were actually caught by one of the recreational anglers fishing from the beach. So we're still trying to figure out exactly where everything, where all these sharks go and what habitat they're using when. So we're, we can't necessarily give you an exact number because that's changing constantly as well. All right, we have a question that says, do sandbars not surface much due to where slash what they prefer to hunt for or another reason, or is it unknown? Um, it's unknown. So some species like to come up to the surface as they're cruising and some species tend to stay deeper. Um, I'm not sure why sandbars don't come to the surface as much. They are known to be around the surface, especially behind like shrimp boats when they're feeding for tuna or something. Um, but most of the time we see our sandbars around structure like oil and gas platforms, artificial reefs or natural banks. So they may be feeding on something that's not coming to the surface as much around those structures. Is the OSEARCH site where we log in to check for tracking? Yes, you can go to the OSEARCH website, so OSEARCH.org, or you can go to MeetOurSharks.org. All our sharks are listed on that website, too. All right, this says, not a question. My comment, excellent, fascinating presentation. Didn't know about the tag types or the ability to see tracks at the site. Great. Glad you learned something. Can you share the link for tracking? Um, if you guys want that link, you can actually email us at distance dot learning at tpwd.texas.gov and I can get you that link. Is there a Shark Week presentation tomorrow? Um, so possibly we may have one more speaker tomorrow. Um, we'll put it on Facebook if we do. What was the second site mentioned for tracking? Uh, Meetoursharks.org. All right, it looks like that is all of the questions we have. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh wait, one more. Oh, it just says thanks. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time out to teach us a little bit more about the sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. And for everyone watching, uh, we do have another presentation this afternoon. So be sure to check in on that. We'll be talking about the illegal shark fin trade. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Gibson, and we'll see everybody later. Thank you.